Good evening and welcome to Quorum. I'm Ron Brown. Tonight, we're focusing on the economy and employment picture in Mississippi. It's a timely subject given the rising rate of unemployment in the state. Economic declines are the primary source of Mississippi's falling revenue picture. Simply put, when the state doesn't bring in the money it expects from taxes, fees, and other sources, then state programs and departments get their budgets trimmed a lot. Governor Haley Barber has already cut almost half a billion dollars from the 2010 budget, and fears about next year's budget brought education advocates out in full force on Tuesday. In the rainy day fund right now, $200 million, another $200 million, $100 million, $100 million, but wait, there's more, another $150 million for the state of Mississippi for this fiscal year. That's Senator Hob Bryan rallying fellow Democrats, educators, and activists at the state capitol. He says Mississippi can utilize money from the Rainy Day Reserve, the Health Care Trust Fund, and other big sources of funding to avoid making huge cuts in education and other state services. Brian got no objections from supporters at the rally, but Republicans in the legislature insist on moving very cautiously with such one-time money. They say the state may see worse times ahead and we need to keep some money in the bank. Meantime, some state agencies have already begun a dreaded process among government workers. The Department of Human Services, the Department of Agriculture and Commerce, the State Tax Commission, and the Public Safety Department all have received state personnel board permission to furlough staffers. More than 5,000 people could be sent home without pay for between 4 and 12 days. More agencies may follow suit as their budgets get tighter and tighter. In other developments, there's a move to bring the 2010 regular session of the legislature to a halt, for right now at least. House Concurrent Resolution 121 would allow lawmakers a few more weeks to craft their 2011 appropriations until Congress decides whether to extend Mississippi's enhanced Medicaid match. Democratic Representative Cecil Brown says that could bring millions of dollars more to the state. We've already given up four days, we'll give up another five days. We need to find out whether the additional federal matching money that Senator Bryan talks about is going to be available. We won't know that for approximately three weeks. The plan that the Senate leadership and the House leadership came up, came together on over the weekend was to recess, come back uh, in the middle to the end of April once we knew about that federal funding and then put a budget together. That move was blocked Tuesday when the House failed to win two-thirds support for the extension. It may be reconsidered this week, but as of right now, House and Senate lawmakers still face a deadline tonight to finish writing the 2011 budget. It's expected to contain $5.5 billion in appropriations, and state services may need every penny of it. One state service in particular remains in limbo. The House has yet to pass a bill to reauthorize the Department of Employment Security. It's the agency that handles unemployment benefits and key job-seeking services in Mississippi. A Senate bill to reauthorize it was amended by the House Labor Committee to allow Mississippi to take in $56 million in additional federal stimulus funding. Governor Barber objected to that because it forces the state to offer unemployment benefits to part-time job seekers. House Labor Chairman Rufus Strotter held on to the amended bill through a key deadline rather than risk its defeat. The governor claims if employment security is not reauthorized, the state's employers could lose some $413 million in federal tax credits. This is hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars a year in tax increases. Uh, and I hope that, that Chairman Strader will reconsider or that the House will uh, take this up so that we don't end up in a situation where the unemployed, the employers, the people who want job training and the community colleges all get trashed because the legislature simply failed to bring this up. Well, we are actually trying to get something together to make sure that uh, before July 1, we will have in place MDES reenactment. And uh, of course, uh, as you know, it's a little bit contentious, but uh, you know, that's part of the process. But what we want to do is make sure that at the end of the day, that we have taken care of 10,000 people 
for the next 12 months, and then for the next three years, 10,000 people each of those three years, and that's what we are working towards. We want to make sure that those people who in the past, who have not been able to receive unemployment benefits because of the way our state law is written, that those people be able to get those benefits. And when we do that, we are actually putting money back into the economy that helped us to close some of those holes that are out there. And with unemployment being at 12 percent, God knows we need all the help that we can get. Representative Strotter was referring to the estimated 40,000 workers who would benefit from those additional unemployment funds over four years. And sadly, there are plenty of Mississippians who might need such insurance. In January 2009, the unemployment rate here was 9.3 percent. A year later, it had jumped to a full 12 percent. That means a lot more of us are looking for work, as seen at the job fair Tuesday in Jackson. They came by the thousands. An estimated 4,000 people put on a nice suit of clothes and a smile and made a day of it at the Trade Mart in downtown Jackson. They had a single purpose in mind. Everyone was looking to land a job. Well, I graduated three months ago and haven't been able to find a job. I have a bachelor's in accountancy, and so far I have found a few open positions, but not so many just because of the economy. Everybody's cutting back on their staff. <laughs> the Mississippi Employment Expo attracted 111 employers with available jobs ranging from driving a truck to office management. There's a lot of opportunities out here. Uh, people just have to come out here and, and look for it. They can't just sit there and wait for something to fall on their laps. Mississippi has been holding jobs fairs like this one since 1993, but the director of the job fair said this year there seems to be a feeling of special significance. Uh, this is probably the most important job fair that we've ever done because of the high unemployment and because of the state of the economy. Mississippi has now joined West Virginia, Idaho, Montana, and Wisconsin with the sharpest unemployment gains in the past three months. First Lady Marsha Barber delivered opening remarks at the job fair, but she was not painting a rosy picture. I'm not so optimistic right now. I think that, as Haley says, Main Street has been disconnected. There's a definite disconnect between Main Street, Wall Street, and our government. So I think until we get all things settled and, and some rules that we know we're going to go by, that we're not going to have businessmen and venture capitalists really go out and start any uh, new employment areas until we know some definite answers and definite rules nationally. So I think the, I, I think I'm, I read gloom doom and I'm afraid I don't feel as good about it as uh, CNBC. Executive Director of the Mississippi Department of Employment Security, Les Range, isn't feeling particularly good about the state of the economy or about the state of flux his department is in. House Democrats who want to bolster unemployment benefits remain at loggerheads with Governor Haley Barber who opposes any expansion and opposes giving part-time workers unemployment rights. Caught in the middle of that fight is the reauthorization of the Mississippi Employment Security Commission. And what's going to happen July 1st, right now there are 67,000 people who get benefits every week, unemployment benefits. Uh, July 1, those people will no longer get their benefits. In addition to that, the businesses that pay into the unemployment insurance trust fund, their taxes are going to go up. Four hundred million dollars is going to go into the federal government and it's going to be used in other states. It's not going to come back to Mississippi. We're going to lose lots of grant funds and events like this that we sponsor, a job fair like this, we won't be able to sponsor it anymore. So we're just asking that the legislature put aside the uh, linking the reauthorization, reauthorization of MDS to some other legislation and get us reauthorized just as quickly as possible. So tonight we are going to talk with experts on the state of the economy and employment in Mississippi. Blake Wilson joins us once again on the panel. He is the president of the Mississippi Economic Council, a nonpartisan advocacy group focused on business and education affairs. Dr. Maury Granger is here. He chairs the Department of Economics, Finance, and General Business at Jackson State University. And Grace Swope joins us this evening as well. He was appointed by the governor three years ago as executive director of the Mississippi Development Authority, the state's leading economic development agency. And of course, we want you to join this conversation as well. Our toll-free phone line is open right now. Dial 1-877-405-5247 with your questions for our guests. That's one 877 
405-5247. And you can also email your questions to quorum at mpbonline.org. And you can join the discussion at twitter.com slash mpbonline. Gentlemen, we're told that the national recession is over, so everyone should be happy, I guess. But has Mississippi begun a recovery yet? Blake Wilson? Well, we're on the road with a road show talking about early childhood education, really not about the economy, but it does give me a chance to meet with literally hundreds of business leaders and ask them just, you know, how are you doing, kind of anecdotally. And the feeling out there is that things are marginally getting better, but that's the positive side of the equation. The negative side of the equation is that as businesses, you know, deal with recession economics, the last thing they do is, is lay off employees and cut back workforce because they try to cut everything else first. And so we're seeing the effects, the lagging effects of this, this economic downturn, and we're feeling it really hard in Mississippi right now. So will that be a quick turnaround? I don't think so. And neither do, anecdotally do the business leaders that I'm talking to. So I think we're going to be talking about a rather slow pull back, pull up from this, uh, from this challenging recession. Okay, and Dr. Granger, uh, do you think that uh, we're seeing uh, the recovery here? Uh, First Lady uh, Marsha Barber said that she thought that uh, the recession hit us a little later than the rest of the country and will probably be one of the last to uh, recover from it. Well, I can't really speak to the timing of when we will recover, but it does seem like Mississippi is making a slow recovery uh, based on the way our population demographic, the way our population breaks out. And with so many unskilled workers, you would expect us to recover slowly. Mm -hmm. and, and that poses a real challenge because when you work with education, when you talk about education reform, trying to figure out which group do you focus on and what type of education do you provide, that, that's problematic and, and politically uh, charged issue. Okay, so, and uh, Grace Swope, uh, uh, Swoop, same, Swope, I'm sorry, <laughs> I told got, you. I, you got it right. I told you I was going to do that. Uh, same question to you, the recovery, do you think that? Uh, well, uh, Mississippi's past history shows that we have lagged behind the national economy when it comes to coming out of recession. And as Blake said, employers, you know, when, when they have to make layoffs, when they, when they lose employment, the last thing they do, especially in uncertain times like they are today, is add more employees. Uh, and so, you know, they will make decisions to be leaner, more efficient, more productive with less than people. And it is a lag, uh, unfortunately, a lag time that we will have before coming out of the recession here. Okay. And uh, from your standpoint, has the recession made it that much more difficult to attract new companies uh, to the state? You know, actually, uh, our, our total activity is down. I mean, if we look at where it was two years ago, it's certainly down. But at the same time, we have to look for opportunities in our state. Uh, where, where are the opportunities for to create economic wealth, create jobs for our people? And there are certainly opportunities out there. And believe it or not, you know, we started out the first of this year announcing a $300 million uh, facility that's going into Tunica County that's going to employ 500 people. Uh, we've also seen expansions of about a dozen companies that will create another over a thousand jobs. So we're seeing opportunities, but certainly, as I said before, there is a lag. Uh, and when there is an opportunity, we're going to be aggressive and go after it. Okay, here's a look at how unemployment breaks down county by county in the state. We see bright spots in some of our more urban areas, including Jackson and Hattiesburg, but we also see high concentrations of the unemployed in counties such as Holmes, Tunica, Winston, and Jefferson. Dr. Granger, are rural communities being hit the hardest by unemployment? And if they are, why would that be? Well, I don't have the exact statistics, but I would suspect they are. Uh, basically from the standpoint, the uh, training and education levels would be low. And when you look at labor markets, the supply and demand for labor, the, you look at the reasons why a company would hire a person. Well, they hire a person because they can do something. And then what determines what a person can do are the inputs that go into the person, the education, the training, their skill levels, and these kind of things. And, and in Mississippi and in the country in general, various groups historically and right now have not gotten the right kind of training and inputs, education, reading levels and whatnot. And so when, when you look at a, at a person 50 years old, uh, around my age, and, and they're laid off, have no skills, and you say, look, you need to go and learn how to do something else. You can't really expect that person to go and learn how to be a computer programmer or learn how to do a high tech job. So in, in some respects, because that population doesn't vote, has low skills, very little money, no political uh, clout, then they're pretty much ignored. And so when we see Wall Street taking off and investments uh, doing well, and, and I've got investments and I want man to do well, but when we see that part of the economy doing well, and then when the 
high tech industries and, and uh, the high, high skilled uh, sector is doing well, this part at the bottom is kind of stuck there. And, and the future does not look good for that part at all. And, and, uh, and even if we put more money into education, uh, that's not going to solve the problem. And if we do more training, that's, that could help, but that's not going to solve the problem. And then deciding what kind of education, what kind of training uh, gets into political arguments back and forth. And then even among scholars, uh, we can't really agree uh, on what is the best approach to take. So, so the future looks pretty bleak nationwide for that low-skilled, uh, untrained part of the population, and in part influenced by our global trade policy and, by, um, and just by the way the global economy is working. It's, it's not a good thing for, for uh, that part of the, that part of the uh, economic system. Mm -hmm. And Blake Wilson, rural communities are hit hardest uh, by the recession, and that's not likely to change in Mississippi. We're going to have rural communities for a long time. No, and that's really historic, and it's not, it's not just unique to Mississippi. If I talk to my counterparts in Nebraska and Kansas and Iowa, those are very similar challenges. They have different demographic makeups than Mississippi has, but they're very similar challenges. But there is a bit of an edge. I mean, the point of, that Gray made is that this, this new manufacturing plant that's doing very high-tech work has located at the northern part of the Delta in Tunica County, one of the, the more challenged counties uh, unemployment-wise that you just saw on the chart. And the opportunity, I think, uh, is putting Mississippi in the place of greatest opportunity. And I think that's really what Governor Barber and MDA has tried to do. They have targeted very effectively on advanced manufacturing, on an edge that we do have and in jobs that we can find workers for. And by doing that, by targeting, they put Mississippi in a place of greater opportunity to get through this challenge. And Gray maybe could elaborate on that a little bit. Well, okay. I, I think that we all have to kind of think about it. It, Mississippi is a rural state, total rural state. Mm -hmm. And some of the areas that we think are metropolitan in the state of Mississippi are truly viewed as rural nationally. Mm -hmm. But there are some bright spots in the rural economy in this state. Uh, you know, you look at uh, the, the, the growth that's happened in Lowndes County in the last uh, few years. Uh, Jack Schultz, who wrote the book uh, Boomtown America, which is about the rural economy in this country, will show that there are pockets all over this country where the rural economy has actually done quite well, and Lowndes County is kind of the poster child of it. Uh, you know, they started out with the Severstall, uh, you know, over a billion dollar investment, mini steel mill. The aerospace business there is booming now. Uh, EADS, American Eurocopter, just produced its 100th helicopter, and that's from a workforce that's never produced a helicopter before. So there are some bright spots around the state. And, and certainly, as I said earlier, we just look for the opportunities to build upon. Well, House Labor Chairman Rufus Strotter says that he believes more should be done to provide jobs and economic opportunities across the state. He says Western Mississippi in particular needs that sort of help that new development might bring. I would hope that we would make this not a rifle point of view, but a shotgun point of view, meaning that we should be looking out for not just a particular part of the state, but the state of Mississippi as a whole. And we know that there's a lot that goes into that. That means that we have to have our educational system together. Uh, we have to have all, all our towns and cities must be doing those kind of things that will attract industry to their, to their, their particular communities. I also think that uh, Mississippi Development Authority uh, could do a little bit better job of making sure that, especially in the second congressional district. And, and I know they'll say that that's a tough sale. But you know, we're here, we're supposed to be people who can deal with tough issues. And tough sale means that we're gonna work, work out things that's best for those people in those underprivileged, uh, underserved areas. Okay, Grace Swope, you had the Mississippi Development Authority. How do regional needs play into MDA's development strategy? Well, first of all, to, to Mr. Strauder, I would never say that any part of our state is a tough sale. Mm -hmm. uh, I was actually in Greenville today in Washington County. He talks about the western part of the state. Uh, I will tell you that MDA has seen every bit of this state. We put up a map today that showed our work in all 82 counties and there's not a, a county in the state that has not had MDA involved in it. But with that said, you, you, the things that we have to do is look at uh, the, 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 the regional economies around our state. What are the economic strengths? What are the assets in those areas and how do we build off of them? We, you know, Albert Einstein uh, defined insanity as continuing to do the same thing over and over and expecting a different result. 
Well, we can't simply do that in economic development. Our team has been, like I said today, in Greenville and working with the leadership there and said, you know, let's talk about other things than the old traditional manufacturing. You know, you look at the cultural heritage in that part of our state. Look at Indianola, Mississippi, and what the B.B. King Museum has done in its first year of operation. Indianola sales and use tax are up. They're up because 30,000 visitors went to that museum in the first year. Now that's people happily leaving money behind in a community that otherwise wouldn't want to. So we have to look at is op uh, entrepreneurial opportunities for the people there that have foot traffic that are coming by that they you know, happily leave those dollars behind. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and one of the facts of that, if you look at the visitors in that museum, about half are international visitors. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, bringing that up, do you think that certain areas such as the Delta, which can be sold to uh, uh, international visitors, do you think that they should get a higher priority for development efforts and, and some more special attention because of that? Well, I, I, look, I, I think all areas of the state have to have special attention. Uh, you know, Governor Barber from the very beginning started what was called Momentum Mississippi. Blake's group, very involved in that. Uh, it helped get it off the ground. But we said from the very beginning, uh, you know, one shoe does not fit all. That each region from a geographic standpoint, from a cultural standpoint, has different needs. And then we should look at economic strategies from a regional standpoint. And I think we're doing that. If you, you know, if you want to talk about the western part of the state and, and, and look at the uh, entrepreneurial opportunities that are being driven right now from the creative economy, there, there, there's like no other there. There's product that's being built for once in our lifetime. People have always talked about the blues but had nowhere to go experience it or see it. That's happening. That's an entrepreneurial type opportunity for us. But as Blake said in Tunica, I mean the gateway to the Delta, 300 million being invested there, that'll have a huge impact on helping bring other businesses further south as, as, as we you know, see our infrastructure. And that's a project, by the way, that Tunica has been working on for 10 years, uh, is bringing manufacturing back to that area of the state. But okay. part of it, Ron, is, is local uh, leaders having a vision. And it's interesting, in that Tunica situation, they, they took a field, a cotton field, mm -hmm. and put a big site up, Future Mega Site. And we, we took a tour with our leadership Mississippi group in Tunica, and the leader of economic development was on the bus, and he said, and over here is our mega site. And you can see the plant here that, that will be operating, and you know, it's an empty cotton field. Mm -hmm. But he is speaking about it as if it were there. Mm -hmm. And I-69 will come along here in front of it, and he is painting a picture so that people could see the opportunity. And I think what Gray pointed out about this blues trail we have, are painting an opportunity here in Mississippi. The MEC annual meeting this year will feature Marty Stewart and Dorothy Moore, two homegrown Mississippi talents, and the governor talking about the Blues Trail. In Alabama, the Robert Trent Jones Golf Trail brought all kinds of economic interest to the state because in a downtime, they created an opportunity. Look at what we can do with the Blues Trail here in Mississippi. A real opportunity to build on a strength in a downtime that doesn't take a lot of resources. Mm -hmm. Dr. Granger. And, and this, these, these are some good points they're making because I have looked at Blueprint Mississippi and Momentum Mississippi and, and that's, that's a good uh, framework for the state. And, and in, that, in that model, if you look at what we were focusing on, that particular type of industry, and, and I had a colleague that did a study on this, and he showed that it, it creates a, a, a wider rift between the bottom and middle class, upper middle class, and, uh, and in the long run, that could lead to a problem, to where you have a lot of people making 60, 70, 80,000 dollars and above, then you've got a real big part of the population that's around 20,000, 15,000, and over time, that creates pressure. And you do have to be creative, like these gentlemen are talking about, to create uh, ways how you can deal with that systemic uh, unemployment problem. And, and then you have to also think about the quality of life of people. So if somebody's going to uh, live in a community where the expected income is $15,000 a year or $20,000 a year, which is not unheard of for Mississippi, then you have to think about what else do these individuals need to where they have a good quality of life. And as we know, health care is a big issue. Mm -hmm. And some people that have health care and have money feel like if you don't have it, you don't need it. And we shouldn't be forced to, you know, how the politics goes with that. And then you can think about other things that you can do. So, so I think we're making good progress. Uh, and, and then another thing, when economists uh, put the models down to look at the economy and do the mathematics, we, we quickly realize that there's an infinite number of solutions and we can't really find a unique solution. So if we take free trade, for example, to its logical conclusion, this is a Hicks or Orlean model, then what will happen is all the workers around the world make the same wage. And I don't think Americans would, would stand for making $3 an hour. 
so that everybody around the world's wages would be the same, mm -hmm. or that capital would freely flow around the world without any kind of impediments. So, so what we have is we have a system to where we have made a decision to move certain things out of the country, and those are the very things that the bottom of our society, uh, as far as skills go, the bottom that they would do. And so we've made a choice to put them out of business. And, and so what, what do they do? And we can't just say, well, get up and move and go where some jobs are, or go back to school and learn how to do something. Because when you take you know, guys my age and, and even younger, uh, they're pretty much set mm -hmm. as far as their skill level. They can't really go back and retool and come back to be an accountant or an economist like I am, or, or those kind of things. So, so, so like these gentlemen are talking about, we have to do some creative things to figure out how we can find our economies of scale, or what we can do good, and figure out a way how we can help the least amongst us and move the state forward. And I think, I think we're doing a pretty good job at that. And I commend the work of, of, of both of your agencies. And I've looked at Blueprint Mississippi, and it looks like a good plan. OK, we're going to go to our first uh, phone call right now. Artis uh, lives in uh, Harris, Harrisburg. What's your question for the panel? Are you, are you there? Yes. OK, go right ahead. Uh, I think we have a problem uh, in the governor's office. Uh, we got a governor, uh, is the governor of the poorest state in the union. He talking about wasting money on a lawsuit because of health care that won't make any difference. You talking about a governor sending over $50 million back out of the poorest state in the union. A governor that's getting on planes, going to Iraq with, and, and other places with bodyguards. Okay, Artis, do you have a question in there? Uh, I mean, we just uh, do you have a question for the panel or, or just that the statement that you want to leave us with that you think that uh, uh, the governor could be more fiscally responsible, I guess? Uh, yes, and, you know, and, and what do they think about, you know, the leadership of the governor and, uh, and his policy of trying to run a state on okay. the backs of poor okay. blacks, women, and the uh, uh, unfortunate Okay, fair uh, question. Thank you, Artis. We'll, uh, we'll ask that question of the panel. Uh, Blake Wilson, uh, uh, Artis brings up the point that the governor is considering uh, spending money on a lawsuit over health care. He thinks that that's a waste of money, at least Artis does. And he also doesn't agree with uh, the governor's decision to give $50 million back in uh, stimulus money. There are a lot of people who agree with Artis. Well, I mean, it, it, you've got to really look at the big picture. I mean, these are all individual elements that, that what you've got to look at is the overall batting average of this governor, which is, which is huge. I mean, I come from a very small state, Delaware, that has been losing employment hand over fist. Uh, and, and because they have not had a focus on going after new industry. This governor has been very, very focused on targeting going after new industry. And so the fact is what Gray was referring to in Lowndes County is an example of a community that came together and prepared itself to get industry and then a governor who went out and helped get it. The same is true for North Mississippi as a community came together and formed an alliance of three counties and said we're going to be in a place of greatest opportunity and when the opportunity went out the governor went out and grabbed that opportunity. The Toyota people will say he went out there and kept calling on them when, when there wasn't even a project in place. So you know the planes and the disagreements over, over policy those are all part of politics. Mm -hmm. But what we have to look at overall is not look at these individual little disagreements and, and, and the same in judging any of our leaders. It's looking at what direction, what vision are they charting. And I think this governor, and, and we are very nonpartisan, we don't endorse any candidate, we don't support one over the other. I think from an economic development record, this governor's got a good record. Mm -hmm. Dr. Granger, do you agree mm -hmm. with that assessment? I agree with that assessment, and I've spoken as a true businessman. <laughs> and, 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 and to add to the, and kind of to support the caller's question, because economics, when we put it down in mathematics, and we know that what well, we argue that mathematics is the best cure for ignorance, and then when we see the economic model cannot give us an answer, and we find infinite number of solutions, then, then we get past economics, past psychology, and we go into quantum physics, and we go into all these other things trying to figure out why do the lightning bugs blink, uh, why do people think the way they think, why does the business community react like it, why is the stock market going up and down? So it gets to a point to where, as you just pointed out, Somebody needs to set a vision and, and, and chart a path. And then the way the human, the way the human man works, everybody thinks they're right. And so, so who, if whoever can convince the most people to see things their way and get the most votes for their policy, 
then that's the course we that's the course we chart. Now I don't know. Maybe the governor is trying to position himself to run for president, and uh, and this is something there. But health care and these kind of things are issues that we need to address because it affects the labor market when we try to balance up uh, supply and demand for labor, and we have to deal with not only health care, housing, education. Any input that you could imagine that goes in somebody's head that would make them employable, we have to think about creatively how can we address those given the resources that we have. Mm -hmm. And Gray, what do you think about uh, uh, artists uh, from Harrisburg? Uh, apparently thinks that the governor's playing a little bit of politics yeah. when he ought to be concentrating more on uh, bringing more money into the state and well, fixing let me our tell financial you, I, problems. I, I, I'm not nonpartisan. <laughs> uh, <laughs> governor Barber's my boss. Mm -hmm. uh, but the, I can tell you, having been around other governors, there is not another governor in this country that is more committed to the state of Mississippi about bringing jobs to our state and economic wealth. And if people want to criticize him, that's fine, but if the, you need to look at the whole picture and not pick out just little p political issues. If you want to, he leads by example. He's a true fiscal conservative. Anybody to call him anything other than that is just, they don't know what they're talking about. Uh, you, you look at his office, they've cut staff in his own office. He leads by example, cut back on his budget. But one thing, like all of us, he understands that if we cut back in some areas, then we, we lose the opportunity. The deal that we just talked about in Tunica, that deal was cut in Singapore. Schultz Company looked at 300 sites all over the globe, all over the globe to site this facility, but they chose Mississippi, and we cut the deal in Singapore. Now, if you're saying the governor no longer needs to travel, needs to stay at home, tell that to those 500 people that will be working in Tunica that, oh, we're out of the business, we can't afford to no longer go out. I, you can tell I'm a little passionate about it, too. <laughs> Just a little bit. <laughs> a little bit. Okay, well, you are watching Quorum on MPB Television and mpbonline.org. We also want to thank our listeners on MPB Think Radio who are out there. And we hope that you'll call in with your questions, just like uh, artists did. The toll-free number is 1-877-405-5247. And you can also email us at quorum at mpbonline.org or follow us on Twitter. I have a phone call right now, as a matter of fact. This is uh, Eric from Tupelo who has a question for our panel. Eric, you go right ahead. If you're there, Eric. Hi, yes. Yeah. Sure, go right ahead, and if you have your TV up, you might want to turn it down uh, because okay. uh, there's a bit of, of a delay there. All right. I was just wondering. Uh, okay. I, one of my I, I was just wondering. Uh, I'm from Tupelo, Mississippi. Okay. And I was wondering, uh, the job that was that's located in this area, average is like mostly like uh, furniture factories and stuff like that. And like most of our jobs, I've been outsourced. Okay, Eric, are you still there? Yes, sir. And I was just wondering, are there planning on any? Are there any jobs coming back in that area? Okay, well, uh, and, and see if I could, if I could address yeah, that. Sure, sure. And, and that, that, that's kind of a, a national policy thing that we need to think about, because. Um, you know, if you look at the trade models, and, and I can't get into a lot of economics, I'd love to on television, but uh, if you look at these models, these simulations, and, and you see that we have made a choice to pursue a certain global policy, and, and the policy that we <coughs> pursue, it brings money to a certain group of people, and it, it does a certain, it affects the stock market a certain way. And then for a business, when you have, I think it's called the principal agent problem, to where the persons that own the business are disconnected from the workers that work in the business. So the, the business owners may do something to make some money, which negatively affects the workers, or, or may negatively impact the town or the state. And so, so when, we, when we have the, the furniture businesses moving to other countries and where somebody will work all week for $10, $10 with no benefits and then they ship the stuff back this way, we, we have a, a, a problem uh, a theoretical problem, and, and economists are well aware of it, and there's a lot of stuff written about it, but the politicians need to uh, make their case, get people behind whatever policy they have, and then we decide where the country is going. And, and my point about, about Momentum Mississippi earlier, where I was talking about focusing on biotech and military industrial complex, all that, all that high tech kind of stuff that brings a lot of money to the state, a lot of tax dollars that we need, so we go for that. And then when you look at the bottom end, where you have um, a lot of these resorts and uh, recreational things that pay very low wages, then, then you create a big 
riff between the bottom and, and the upper part of the middle. And that has the potential in the long run to tear your, your social fabric. And so, so people far, far range thinking must think about what kind of country do we want to have and how are we gonna do it? Now I'm gonna end with this point. Suppose uh, instead of me making my own kids clean the house up, I get my neighbor's kids to come over and clean it up because they'll do it cheaper. And, and then so after, after I do that over time, well I've got one at home that doesn't know how to clean up, won't clean up, and I'm taking all my money and put it in the house next door instead of using my money within my own house. And, and that's sort of the problem that we face when we think about how far do we go with uh, free trade in every industry and where do, where, do, where do we stop with that? Well, a troubling report came out this month from the Southern Education Foundation. The nonpartisan group linked unemployment to levels of educational attainment and it found that 16% of high school dropouts in Mississippi are unemployed. So are about 11% of high school graduates. Those were some higher education or those with some higher education are faring better. And less than 5% of Mississippians with a bachelor's degree or higher they are unemployed. Blake Wilson, clearly that ties to the MEC's outlook on education and prosperity. Well, and it's just gr it's great you brought that up because we are on a statewide tour focusing on early childhood education, which was a big component of that report that came out. And the mm -hmm. reason early childhood is part of it is that they say we've got to be investing in early childhood because we're missing the boat. If we wait till the, the kid's in high school and he's dropping out, it's too late. How do we invest now? Well. Jim Barksdale lead, led an effort to pull together $10 million, all public, all private sector funding, with the exception of $500,000, which was public sector, $10 million to fund Mississippi Building Blocks, which establishes a program of intervention for early childhood child care and learning facilities. And so we are out promoting how communities can connect into that and really make a difference. So again, when the economy's down, when there isn't enough money to go around for IHL, for K through 12, for community and junior colleges already, and we have this issue that long term, if we don't do something with early education, what are we gonna do? The way we do it is the private sector steps up and starts doing more to become faster, cheaper, smarter, and better. And we have had record turnouts all over the state. In fact, tomorrow morning, we have 230 people coming to Jackson to focus on this issue, how we can stimulate this with the private sector. And then when the economy improves, three years from now, when things are moving again, and it's gonna move again, uh, we hope it'll be within three years, mm -hmm. then we can say, how does this fit in to a public sector priority? So that's really what this is all about, is what Dr. Granger was saying. That's how do we find the right niches? Because I, I agree, the challenge is we, we can't ignore a low-skilled population. We've gotta be able to raise that skill level up through workforce training for the adult side, and that's why this unemployment bill is so important, and then through early education to put ourselves in the place of greatest opportunity mm -hmm. for when the economy comes back. Okay, and you're agreeing with just about everything he says there, oh, yeah, Dr. He's, Granger. He's, he's speaking my language. <laughs> you're listening and, <laughs> and agreeing with everything. Well, among the figures that we're seeing in our labor research, there are big declines to report in the last year in mining, logging, construction, and manufacturing sectors. Construction in particular is down 13% since January of 2009. And there are a few growth areas as well, but jobs in education, healthcare, and even government are showing modest gains. Gary, uh, should we look to a particular sector for uh, signs of hope? I'm sorry, Gray, and uh, does our economic diversity remain key? Absolutely. I, I think that, you know, again, I'll go back to what I said earlier. You, you have to look at the state and where you have strengths to build upon. But certainly, we, we've got a couple of areas in the state that we think there's some great opportunity right now. Uh, one has been the aerospace business. Uh, the aerospace aviation uh, business in the state has always had a stronghold in our state. It's one we probably have not promoted enough. But uh, when you start having companies like GE Aviation uh, that builds the facility in Batesville for composite jet engine uh, fan platforms. Uh, they announced an expansion last year. Uh, they're on the way up to around 300 jobs there uh, in the composite business. You had Alliant Tech Systems or ATK to announce their facility uh, in uh, Tishomingo County for the composite spines for the uh, Airbus A350, I believe. Uh, they start building capacity. And what I like about it as an opportunity from the state is, you know, GE is the great example. They came in and first and said, you know, before we get started, we're going to use the Raspit Flight Center at Mississippi State University to do our, our, our test bed. So they set it up there. They have 
students from our universities be a part of it. They have uh, the engineers in the aerospace engineering program there to be a part of it. And then they move the line to Batesville. Well, we gain from that because we have our students that can work there now. We have the professors now that understand the process that can support it. But that was phase one. Phase two now has moved the University of Southern Mississippi uh, in our polymer science and advanced material program there, which is, you know, world renowned. And not only ha are they looking at the pro they're, they're looking at the, the advanced material itself. How do we improve the process by changing the makeup, the composite makeup, the composites to help them have a better process? So the aerospace is a great opportunity and that goes from the coast all the way to the northern part of the state. Uh, you know, we mentioned, we've, we've mentioned a lot about Lowndes County, but you look at the Mississippi coast, uh, you know, Northrop is our largest employer of the state. Well, they make unmanned aerial vehicles now in, in, in Jackson County. And so we have opportunities there in aerospace, Stennis on the other side and all the way up through the state. Okay. Uh, we have a call from Tennessee, from Raymer, Tennessee. James has a question for our panel. Go right ahead, James. How y'all doing tonight? Uh, I, uh, my, I've been out of work for about a month and a half now, mm -hmm. and uh, I've been everywhere. I've been to Jackson, I've been to Corinth, and Booneville, Tupelo, and Memphis. I walked around Memphis all week last week on foot, just going door to door trying to find a job. I uh, I can't file for unemployment because last year I worked as a 1099 employee, and I'm 30 years old, never filed unemployment before in my life, and they told me that I can't have unemployment. So now I've lost my house, my car got repoed, and I don't have a job, mm -hmm. and don't know what to do, don't know where to go to find a job. Because mm -hmm. every time I go somewhere, they keep telling me, well, we'll call you. And I never hear anything back. And it's been a month and a half now, and I just don't know what to do. Okay, James, thank you for your call. Uh, Blake, do you have any uh, advice for uh, for James? Well, I think I think one thing is to connect in, and it, it, he may have already done this, uh, but uh, the Win Job Centers in Mississippi are a very good resource, and they involve a combination of not only connecting people to what jobs may be available, but also providing training to get people up to speed. So that, if he hasn't gone to the Wynn Job Center there in Corinth, and there's one right there in Corinth, I a sense that he must be just in that neck of the woods, um, that, would be a, that would be, I would say, the first stop uh, mm -hmm. to, to really look at for a job is to connect into the Wynn Job Centers because that's a whole different operation than it was 10 years ago. It used to be a place that just people went to get an unemployment benefit, but it's really now a place to connect into what's happening. But just to build on what Gray was saying about, about opportunities, um, I do want to give a little credit also to Congressman Betty Thompson. Uh, you know, Congressman Thompson has really focused on the Delta and said, you know, how do we, how do we take advantage of some of Mississippi's heritage to, to really build opportunity for entertainment districts? And so at our annual meeting that will be coming up on April 15th, not only do we have the governor who will be speaking about what's happened with the Blues Trail and what a great opportunity, we're going to have a panel. Grace Swope will be on it, as well as our lieutenant governor, but also Congressman Benny Thompson via video to talk about how important this is. So really a lot of people on both sides of the aisle are talking about this issue and how we maximize it. And in a down economy, boy, it's tough. It's tough to look positively because you're dealing with so many fires, so many problems, so many issues like this gentleman who just called in who's, you know, had a real tough time. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't sound really positive to say, well, you're looking for years out, but we have to. We have to position ourselves mm -hmm. and while at the same time making sure that we reauthorize an organization like the Department of Employment Security so that that Win Job Center is still there and so there's a place for him to connect to. Okay, and one of the things that is going to help, obviously, is bringing more jobs into the state. What is it that makes uh, a particular community more attractive to some of these businesses from out of state? Well, I again, as I said earlier today, we were in Greenville and we had the same discussion. Uh, and economic development is truly a team sport. Uh, the state can work on everything from job training to having uh, a very good business climate, which we do, address issues like tort reform, but at the end of the day, it is not Mississippi that's competing with Louisiana, Arkansas, Tennessee, or Alabama. It is truly the community. It's the community competing with the community in the other, in the other state. So what we have to do is make sure that our community partners are stepping up and doing the things on the local level, being you know, uh, innovative, as we said earlier, and looking at new ways to create economic wealth. What are they doing to be prepared? You know, if we want to talk about the old economy and manufacturing, you know, people say, you know, we want that. Well, if they haven't gone out and done their homework on having a site, more than just a cotton field, you know, how are you going to get infrastructure there? How are you going to get water, sewer? How are we going to hire the people? 
how we present this. You know, I'm amazed still today that, you know, for the most part of our state, everybody does a great job, but our clients expect information in a professional, modern way, and in some of our communities, we have to coach them along that it's not getting the, the highlighter out and just doing the site, uh, that they got to do a little bit more homework on that to not only talk about the site, but what is the workforce around it. Okay, we have a caller uh, from Gulfport. This is Vincent. What is your question for the uh, panel tonight, uh, Vincent? Sure. Um, uh, I do have a question, however. Uh, my question is centered around uh, the job market. Uh, it looks to me that nationwide, and of course here in Mississippi, um, one of the most critical areas of concern is uh, job loss or creating jobs. And I've heard uh, a solution uh, from some uh, political leaders that we need to nationwide provide tax breaks uh, or tax cuts to businesses. Uh, some of them small businesses, some of them just said businesses, but provide this, uh, these tax cuts to businesses, which would, um, I guess, in theory, allow them to expand uh, to uh, maybe uh, delay laying off uh, customers, or not customers, but laying off uh, uh, their workers. However, I don't believe that that's an accurate theory uh, to create jobs or to maintain jobs, because jobs are maintained or created, in my belief, since I'm talking to other business owners, small business owners, uh, by demand for your product or service. If there's no demand for your product or service or a decline in demand for your product or service, you would not expand your business, uh, your warehouse, or, uh, or hire more people or delay laying off your workers uh, if demand has declined for your product or service. So how can giving tax breaks to small businesses uh, or you know, businesses overall uh, uh, let me rephrase. What is the driving factor to creating uh, demand? Because okay. my belief is by creating that demand, we will uh, then be able to uh, maintain workers' jobs and uh, okay, create Vincent. an environment to where they All right, will, well, uh, let, let us let, let, uh, let uh, uh, Dr. Gray uh, answer the uh, question. I'm sorry, okay. Dr. Granger. Okay, um, well, the quick answer to his question is uh, the tax cuts decrease uh, production costs. And whether or not you focus on the demand side or the supply side goes, goes back again to what you believe. And everybody believes they got the right idea. So you can fashion your economic policy towards uh, supply side economics, quote unquote, to where you focus on uh, reducing cost of production, taxes, and doing different things that would help on that side. Or you could look on the demand side, on the consumer side, and see well, what could you do on that side to stimulate the economy. So that's. That's the quick answer to his, to his question. Okay, and we have a question uh, via email. Uh, uh, someone wants to know why we don't manufacture smart meters, solar panels, or wind turbines and get manufacturing back into Mississippi through the green energy programs that are out there. I, I'd, I'd like to jump on that if I could. Okay. Yeah, there, 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 in the legislature, there, there is a three target sectors that we have a, a grouping of incentives. One of those is clean ener energy manufacturing. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, states around us, uh, have addressed that, uh, where they have a certain set of incentives for this growth industry. Uh, for instance, if you look at Arkansas, there are two now wind blade manufacturers there. Uh, you have uh, solar in Tennessee. But one of the things that we are seeing these projects, uh, and we can compete on them, but we're just going to tweak our, our, our legislation a little bit so that we can be more competitive on it in the clean energy manufacturing uh, sector. When I, when I say clean energy, that's anything from manufacturing of nuclear components. Mm -hmm. We've seen that this uh, the administration uh, is smiling favorably on nuclear. Uh, we think that's a, a positive opportunity for our state, not only for maybe a second uh, uh, reactor there at Port Gibson, but also uh, having the opportunity to manufacture the components that go with it that create jobs. Same thing for wind turbines. We are working solar projects now. Uh, there's been a bill that's been passed for an unidentified company that I'm not going to announce tonight. Uh, but we're, we're uh, talking with somebody who wants to bring solar and uh, And I think we have, a, we, we have a real opportunity. It's, it's down to us in, in one other location, and uh, you know, I feel very positive about it. And, and Ron, Momentum Mississippi, uh, you know, under the governor's leadership, actually spun off an initiative called the Mississippi Energy Policy Institute and raised entirely private sector funds to put under contract uh, Dr. Jason Dean, uh, who is leading a policy focus on making certain that Mississippi will be policy-wise in the right place, the place of greatest opportunity on energy policy. And right now, MEC is just kind of housing this group until they can 
you know, get their own legs, and we think that'll happen probably within the next 60 days. And then they'll be off separate and complete on their own. But it's entirely private sector funded. Again, when you don't have the resources in the public sector to be able to do it, it's time for the private sector to say, look, there's a chance that we're going to be able to stimulate an opportunity here. So we're going to invest some dollars into seeing, making sure that Mississippi is in the place of greatest opportunity. Okay, we have another uh, phone caller. This is uh, Jerry from Wiggins who has a question for our panel. Jerry, go right ahead. Yes, sir. This is Jerry Alexander, the mayor of Wiggins, Mississippi. Okay. I appreciate your your your, your, uh, your panel there, and I just want to make a few comments about uh, our governor Haley Barber. What an excellent job he has done, and he is doing. We're making progress from north and south, east and west. Uh, Grace Swoops, I appreciate everything you've done for us through the MDA. We received about five million dollars in grants. Re redid downtown Wiggins, a sport complex, and just on and on. And great, and I appreciate that. Thank you, talk, talk a little bit about the Port of Gulf Port. It's going to be the biggest uh, project that's ever it's hit Mississippi uh, uh, since uh, Shipyard and, and NASA. And, and, and I'm just thankful that we got leaders in our state that we have. It, 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 it's everybody working together to, to make things happen. Uh, after the storm, uh, our, our governor went to work immediately. And, and, and brought us out of this thing, and, and, and I know we need more jobs. Uh, I know we need a lot of things, but we're, we're in better shape than a lot of states in, in this United States are today. And, and one, one comment I, I do want to make is about our community colleges. I'm a journeyman machinist by trade. Uh, mm -hmm. I happen to be the mayor of Wiggins now, but trade schools and community colleges, I think we need to put more emphasis on them. And again, I appreciate your program, and thank you very much for taking my call. Okay, Mayor, thank you very much. Uh, what about that, Dr. Granger? Are we doing enough to uh, educate uh, the uh, workforce so that they are qualified for the jobs that... Uh, well, that's a loaded question. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> we're trying to get money. I was supposed to say, no, we need more <laughs> money. Uh, uh, well, I think we're doing a good job in Mississippi. they spreading money around the best we can. Of course, there's a lot of things that we could do different. Uh, one that comes to mind, uh, I've been trying to get some traction on all of the schools in the state purchasing their online resources together, like your electronic databases. And we waste millions of dollars where Jackson State will buy theirs, Ole Miss will buy its, its own, and East School will buy its own, where in California and Georgia and the Carolinas, they buy for the entire state and share it. But, but, but as far as uh, uh, the, the, the general made a good point about community colleges and, and job training, and where do you draw the line? And that, that gets back to some leadership uh, issues to where how much should you focus on, on the uh, four-year universities versus this? And then even at the, at the bottom end of the scale, is it important to have uh, pre-kindergarten programs? And that, that seems to be an issue. And, and then so, so the education part is uh, definitely important. And I think we're doing, doing as well as we can with the limited resources that we got. Okay, we have just a few minutes, uh, about uh, six or seven minutes left in the show. And before we leave, uh, uh, Blake Wilson, I'd like to know what you think about uh, uh, any key things that, are, that you want to see accomplished in the uh, legislature as far as uh, economic development initiatives. Well, I, th I think what's really important is that, that they, they, they stay the course, and I, I think they've pledged to do that. I mean, I don't think they have. They have. Both, both houses have pledged that they're going to keep the, the, the taxes under control here in Mississippi. They're not going to raise taxes. They're going to they're find a way to live within their means. They're going to they're going to keep this economic engine running as best as they can in keeping us in the place of the greatest opportunity. But I think what's important is that this legislature focuses on the fact that we have got to really work together and find ways to be faster, smarter, and cheaper and better. And I think that's happening. And what they're going through now with the cuts in Mississippi government is very painful. But, you know, in my own business, we've cut our staff through attrition, fortunately, 34% in the last two years. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, believe me, we, we the private sector feels the pain. And, and now state government, sadly, is feeling the pain. That's tough. I mean, it's not easy. You know, Ronald Reagan said it most effectively back in the 1980s. He said, you know, a uh, recession is when, um, is when your neighbor is unemployed. A depression is when you're unemployed. Mm -hmm. And that was very telling statement and, and believe me I have great compassion this is dif these are difficult times and there are a lot of people who are very well struggling but I do believe there is light at the end of the tunnel and I believe Mississippi is well positioned because of, and the, the previous caller the mayor pointed out the port of Gulfport 
that is a huge opportunity out of a out of a terrible storm out of a terrible tragedy has come the opportunity to put Mississippi in a great place of opportunity because the Panama Canal is being widened and Gulfport now is really at the center of being in a great location and that port is going through a huge expansion that'll be railroads jobs really positive okay and let me ask uh, Dr. Granger about uh, uh, what you'd like to see accomplished in the legislature as far as uh, economic development initiatives in this session that's just wrapping up well, I'm not really tuned into the exact details of what's going on. These other gentlemen are, but what I would like to see uh, the, the state focus on uh, on job growth and and continuing to work with Blueprint Mississippi and and Momentum Mississippi. And and uh, I really don't have a specific agenda that that I'm following with the legislation. Okay. And what about uh, what about you, Greg? Well, certainly we're following legislation. I mentioned the aerospace. Uh, we're looking at clean energy. We're looking at data centers. We also have our our infrastructure programs that are in the legislature that we're monitoring, but I will take a, a t just a quick second and say, it, state government can do it too, and I'm proud of our agency and our work, and, and, and certainly with the leadership of Governor Barber, but the Mississippi Development Authority has been able to do just as much, if not more, than we have in the past, but we're doing it with a 30% less budget than we had in 2002, and we also consciously have reduced our workforce by 17% since 2004 through natural attrition. And we wouldn't be able to be competitive today with, without doing that. Okay, and federally, what do you think the federal government can do? Well, we need to, we need to drive out uncertainty. Uncertainty is a job killer. And as long as we're uncertain where we're going on some of the, some of the legislation in Washington, it'll continue to be a job killer. Okay, okay. and uh, do we get an amen from Dr. Granger as well? Sort of. Sort of. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well that's all the time we have for tonight. I'd like to thank our guests and we also thank you for joining our discussion tonight. We'll have this edition of Quorum available for viewing online at mpbonline.org. Forum returns next Wednesday at 7 with more coverage of Legislature 2010 and the state's budget crisis. I'm Ron Brown. I hope you have a good night.